This is Winchester Academy. Without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Hetzler. And thank you for coming. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. I certainly appreciate all of you coming tonight. I hope the talk is worth it. <laughs> so I will be talking about the neurobiology of stroke. And first, I'll talk about my own stroke. And then I'll talk about stroke in general. So I had a stroke on July 18th. 2011. My wife, Ruthann, and I had just returned from a trip to Pittsburgh. We arrived at the Green Bay Airport, and I drove us home to Appleton. My wife went inside and went upstairs in our condo to take a shower while I carried in the luggage. When she came downstairs, she found me on the floor and called 911. I was taken to Appleton Medical Center and then transferred to Theta Clark Hospital in Nina. They told my wife and children, I told my wife that my children should meet me there, that the situation was grave, and I would probably not live through the night. At Theta Clark, it was determined that I had had a hemorrhagic stroke in my right thalamus. A neurosurgeon came in, drilled a hole in my head, and put a tube in to drain out the blood. They took CT scans of my brain, and my primary care doctor later told me that when he first saw a CT scan of my brain, he assumed that I had died. I think he was wrong. I was put into a drug-induced coma for eight days and then spent another seven days in the intensive care unit. At this time, a neurologist told my wife that if I survived, I would not be the same person. He was also wrong. I'm still the same smart aleck I was before. <laughs> Thank you. Because I was too weak for therapy, I was sent to Peabody Manor Nursing Home for a month. I could not walk at this time and had very limited use of my left arm and hand, as well as a subluxed left shoulder, that means partially separated, double vision, and what's called unilateral neglect. That is, I tended to ignore things on the left side of my body and in my left visual field. I was not blind in my left side, but I ignored everything. My therapist later told me that they'd be sitting around a table, and I would be at one end, and I would be conversing with the therapist on my right, but totally ignoring those on my left. They said they would wave their hands and go, hey, Bruce, over here, over here. And I would just ignore them. Now, I should point out, I no longer have unilateral neglect. So if you get bored and get up to leave, I will recognize that <laughs> and make a note of it. After a month at the nursing home, I was transported back to Theta Clark Hospital for three weeks of inpatient rehabilitation. I had physical occupational, and speech therapy. My wife came to visit me every day the entire time I was at Peabody Manor and at the hospital. And it was that, more than anything else, that kept my spirits up. I couldn't wait to go home. I thought that everything would be easier then. This time, I was wrong. <laughs> On October 1st, 2011, I was sent home in a wheelchair. 
We had to move our bedroom downstairs, and my wife had to bring all my clothes downstairs. This was followed by three weeks of home therapy. I transitioned from a wheelchair to a walker. First, it had a left armrest on it because of my subluxed shoulder. And then after some treatment of the shoulder, the armrest was removed. I then started using a quad cane, which I still have, and I use when I teach at Lawrence or when I give talks. But I also have a single point cane, and sometimes I can walk without any cane at all. At home, I realized that I could no longer drive. To begin with, at the time we had two cars and both had manual transmissions. And I could not use my left leg uh, to operate the clutch. We sold both cars and bought a single car with an automatic transmission. The following summer in 2012, I took a driving course at St. Elizabeth Hospital in Appleton. It was necessary to alter the car somewhat. There's a knob on the steering wheel so I could drive with one hand and an extension of the turn signal that goes behind the steering wheel so I can use my right hand to operate the turn signal as well. I also had to take, retake my driver's examination, both the written and the driving test. And I passed both very well. Although my wife still won't let me drive as much as I'd like to. <laughs> In October or November, I went with my walker to see the neurologist that was there the night I was first admitted to the hospital. And she got tears in her eyes. She had not expected me to survive the night. I was totally unprepared for the muscle changes in terms of muscle tone following my stroke. First, the initial flaccidity or weakness and the later spasticity or increase in muscle tone. I learned about them by reading the book Stronger After Stroke by Peter Levine. And I would recommend that for any stroke survivor or their family if you really want to learn about a stroke. To deal with the spasticity or the increase in muscle tone, I was put on a low dose of a drug called baclofen, which I did not want to take. Why? Well, before my stroke, I had published two scientific papers on the effects of baclofen in rats. And I didn't like what it did to them, and I didn't want it to do that to me. I did not think that the baclofen was of much help. In 2015, a paper was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association indicating that drugs with strong anticholinergic activity increase the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease in people over the age of 65. Now, I'll try to simplify this a bit. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter in the brain, and some drugs block the effects of acetylcholine, and those effects are called anticholinergic activities. Things like dry mouth, constipation, and memory problems. So this study, again, pointed out that drugs that have strong anticholinergic effects increase the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease. Not wanting to get Alzheimer's disease, I stopped taking baclofen. <laughs> I missed two terms of teaching at Lawrence University, which started teaching again from a wheelchair during the spring term of 2012. I should point out, I had to take an eight hour neuropsychological test in order to regain my job, which I passed with flying colors. In fact, since that time, 
I've written three scientific papers, and the most recent was just accepted for publication. I've been in and out of physical and occupational therapy ever since my stroke. Interesting, one of the best things I learned in physical therapy was how to walk down the stairs backwards. I hold onto the railing with my right hand and walk down backwards. It's far easier for someone with a stroke to do that than to walk down forwards and risk falling. I continue to have what's called post-stroke fatigue. That is, I tire easily. So if I put myself to sleep up here, you'll understand why. <laughs> now, I will start talking about uh, my talk, and if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hands and ask them. Although there will be time for questions at the end, but no time for answers. <laughs> so here we go. These are the topics that I will talk about. Brain structure, stroke type, the impact of the location of the stroke, and neuroplasticity. In the United States each year, more than 795,000 people have a new or recurrent stroke. And about two in every three stroke survivors will have some form of disability. And stroke is a leading cause of disability among American adults. In the vast majority of survivors, the sudden and lasting physical effects of stroke lead to a catastrophic disruption in their sense of self and in their relationship with the physical and social world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Need to drink a little water. No, it's not vodka. Post-stroke depression is the most prevalent psychiatric disorder following stroke. It affects nearly one-third of the survivors during the first five years of uh, stroke onset. <clears throat> and I was on the antidepressant Lexapro for about two years to help prevent that. Also, stroke sufferers are two to three times more likely to develop a chronic pain than known stroke sufferers. There's a syndrome called central pain syndrome that some stroke survivors have. Luckily, I never had this. But in that, the affected side of the body um, will have a burning pain whenever it's touched or it rubs against something. And there is no pharmacological treatment for it. The only treatment such as it is is something like Mindfulness meditation, but there are no drugs that can deal with it. Depressed mood, social isolation, poor subjective well-being, and mental distress contribute to increased motor impairment, disability, and the risk of future stroke. That's the left hemisphere of your brain. And what you're looking at is the outer portion, which is called the cerebral cortex. Cortex means bark, and like the bark of a tree, the cortex is the outer portion. By the way, do you know how you can tell a tree is a dogwood tree? By its bark. My wife told me not to tell that joke, but what the heck. I like it anyway. Now you can divide the cortex into different lobes or portions. The frontal lobe is at the front of the brain. Behind that is the parietal lobe. The frontal lobe controls body movement. The parietal lobe is a sensory portion of the brain 
That's where you feel touch, temperature, and pain. The occipital lobe is at the back of the brain, and that's where you see. You see something when the information from your eye or your eyes finally reach the occipital lobe, and finally the temporal lobe is involved in hearing and memory. Now, if we look down on top of the brain, we can sort of divide it into a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. And as you can hopefully see here, there is a contralateral control and receipt of information. So the left hemisphere of the brain receives information from your right visual field, while the right hemisphere of your brain receives information from your left visual field. Is that clear? Okay. Now, the left hemisphere of your brain controls language. Here's the left hemisphere of the brain. And I'll just talk about some of the structures here. At the front of the brain is a portion called Broca's area. That portion controls the production of speech. Oftentimes, Stroke patients will suffer from what's called Broca's aphasia, in which they have problems talking. There's one uh, well-known case of a woman that had a stroke. She was a minister's wife, and the only two words she could say were, hello and damn it. So damage to Broca's area produces Broca's aphasia. Back in the late 1950s, there was a rock group named Jan and Dean. They were contemporaries of the early Beach Boys. Uh, two of their hits were Little Old Lady from Pasadena and uh, Dead Man's Curve. Jan was in an automobile accident that damaged his left frontal lobe. So he was paralyzed on the right side of his body and he had Broca's aphasia. He could hardly talk at all. Interestingly, he could still sing. Why is that? Because singing is controlled by the right hemisphere. But getting back to the left hemisphere, there's a structure here at the top of the temporal lobe called Wernicke's area. This structure is involved in understanding speech. If it's damaged, you will suffer from what's called Wernicke's aphasia. In Wernicke's aphasia, you do not understand the speech of others. It sounds like a foreign language. Your own speech is fluent but meaningless, much like a politician. <laughs> also, in the left hemisphere, there's a band of fibers that interconnects Broca's area and Wernicke's area. It's called the arcuate fasciculus. And it's through that band of fibers that you talk to yourself. And again, that's in the left hemisphere. If we cut the brain down the middle, you can see uh, structures here. This is the brain stem. Below that would be the spinal cord. Down here, is a structure called the medulla. The medulla <coughs> controls the vital reflexes of the body. Things like breathing and heart rate. The main cause of an overdose of drugs like opioids is cessation of breathing because they depress the breathing centers in the medulla. 
So if you have a stroke in this area, it will typically be fatal. This is a coronal section to the brain. And up here, we have uh, neurons that send their axons all the way down into the spinal cord. On both sides of the brain. And just medial to that is the thalamus. So I mentioned I had a stroke in my right thalamus and it's right next to these descending fibers. So that's why the left side of my body is affected. <coughs> Coursing up through the middle of the brain stem is a complicated structure called the reticular formation. The main function of the reticular formation is to keep the brain awake. The main cause of coma is damage to the reticular formation. And here we have the spinal cord. It's about the size of your little finger. And here you have nerves coming in and out of the spinal cord. It's through those nerves that the spinal cord connects to your muscles and controls them. So for that to happen, the brain has to connect to the spinal cord. This is a cross section through the spinal cord. And here you have cell bodies that send their axons out to the muscles that move the body around. So uh, neurons all the way up in the motor cortex and to send their axons down to these cells in order for those cells to control the movement of the body. And here we have some individual neurons. Your brain has about over 100 billion neurons. Now I tell my students not to worry about that number because I will not expect them to learn any more than half of them by name. Here's what an individual neuron looks like. There's a cell body. Sticking out from it are dendrites. Those dendrites receive information from other neurons. And then this neuron has an axon through which it communicates with other neurons. Here's an artist's conception of a synapse. It is through the synapse that one neuron connects to another one. You have an axon ending, a space here, which is called the synaptic cleft, and the postsynaptic membrane. So there are three portions, the cleft, the presynaptic membrane, that's the axon ending, and the receiving neuron, the postsynaptic membrane. It's through the synapse that one neuron connects with another. An individual neuron, shown here, can have up to 50,000 synapses on it. It's through those synapses that you think, have emotions, motivations, and move. So any disruption in these synaptic connections will alter the way you think, emote or move. So, in a stroke, reduction in blood flow of sufficient duration and extent lead to a stroke, which results in damage to those neuronal networks and the resulting impairment in sensation, movement, or thought. There are two types of stroke, ischemic and hemorrhagic. Ischemic or obstructive stroke is the most common form, accounting for about 87% of strokes. 
that occurs when blood flow becomes blocked, mainly due to blood clots. A hemorrhagic stroke accounts for about 13% of strokes, but 90% of them are fatal. And this arrives from ruptured blood vessels in the brain. And here you can see examples of ischemic stroke on the left, hemorrhagic on the right. So what causes a stroke? Got to drink some more water here. A common cause of stroke is atherosclerosis, a hardening of the arteries. So you have plaque buildup, clogs up the arteries, leaving less space for blood to flow. Atherosclerosis makes it easier for a clot to form. A hemorrhagic stroke often results from uncontrolled high blood pressure. And that was my problem. I had high blood pressure that was not well controlled. Here you have an example of an artery clogged with plaque. Location, location, location. Just like real estate, the location is important in stroke. Exactly how a stroke affects someone is dependent on what side of the brain it occurs and the amount of damage that it causes. Some people may just have temporary arm or leg weakness, while others may lose the ability to speak or to walk. <coughs> A stroke in the left hemisphere will have language problems as a result. The person may not be able to comprehend or communicate. So a variety of forms of aphasia can result from left hemisphere damage. When the right hemisphere is affected, intuitive thinking, reasoning, problem solving, and Perceptual judgment and spatial functions, functions can be impaired. So a right hemisphere stroke can make it difficult to, to locate objects, walk up or down stairs, or get dressed. I should point out that my wife is impressed that I can dress myself in the morning. But then she was impressed that I could dress myself in the morning before my stroke. When the, this is an example showing that damage to the right side of the brain affects the left side of the body. Armparasis. Armparasis is not uh, the same as paralysis, but it's not normal either. It's sort of halfway in between normal and paralyzed. Armparasis arises from a loss of input to those motor neurons in the spinal cord that send their axons out to the affected muscles. Only about 50% of patients with significant armparasis ever recover useful function. And the initial severity is the best predictor of recovery from armparasis. Attempts to use stroke location to predict arm recovery to greater recovery for cortical than subcortical strokes. Subcortical is anything below the cerebral cortex. In order to recover as best you can from a stroke, it's important to learn new things, new skills. That's better than just simply redoing some movement over and over again. Now earlier, I mentioned spasticity. Spasticity is comprised of increased resting muscle tone and hyperreflexia, that is increased reflexes. If I'm laying in bed in the morning and 
the alarm goes off, the left side of my body jumps, but not the right side. It's the left side of my body that was affected. And spasticity involves increased muscle tone in the so-called anti-gravity muscles. Those are the muscles that counteract the effects of gravity. So for your arms, that's the flexors. Gravity pulls your arms down, so your flexor muscles counteract that. For your legs, it's the extensors. Gravity pulls you down, you have to move your extensors to stand up. So your flexors in the arm and extensors in the legs are the anti-gravity muscles. And that's shown here. There's a joint, the extensor muscle, and the flexor muscle. So when the extensor muscle contracts, it extends the limb. When the flexor muscle contracts, it flexes the limb. So in humans, uh, in a severe case of spasticity, the person's affected arm will be like this with its fingers clenched like that. Or the legs will be rigidly extended. If a cat had a stroke, it would look like that. It would look like a stuffed cat. So what about recovery from stroke? Well, many patients do survive. Obviously, I survived. And there is an initial spontaneous recovery of some functions. And that can be augmented by rehabilitation. Now, the spontaneous recovery isn't complete, typically, and doesn't go on forever. The spontaneous motor recovery typically only occurs for about six months. And physicians used to be trained that that was it, that that was the end of recovery. That is not true. You can continue to recover for years. It takes a lot of work, but it is possible. After six months, that's all that will spontaneously recover, but recovery can continue for decades. Turns out there's a remarkable amount of plasticity in the brain. In fact, there are parallels between plasticity in the developing nervous system and those taking place in the adult brain after a stroke. So there can be continued recovery of facilitated by therapy. And it's all because of what's called neuroplasticity. Your brain has neuroplasticity from the cradle to the grave. Every day you're alive, your brain has neuroplasticity. That is, your brain can change by forming new neural connections. And this can allow neurons to compensate for damage. In simple terms, neuroplasticity is the process of rewiring the brain to perform tasks through different neural pathways. That said, your post-stroke behavior is unlikely to be identical to pre-stroke pre behavior because in a stroke, Neurons do die, and others can take over those functions, but they will not control your movement exactly the same way that the lost ones control it. Also, the tools used to assess recovery can't really distinguish between 
true recovery, compensation, or a combination of the two. They can say that you could perform a particular function, but not if you're doing it exactly the same way. <coughs> That understand stroke recovery mechanisms, I should point out that uh, your sensory and motor and cerebral cortex, the motor cortex, remember, was the frontal lobe, but the parietal lobe was the somatosensory, are loosely organized into what are called somatotopic functional maps. Your body is basically mapped out on your brain sort of draw a little person or humunculus up there that indicates the body part or the, the brain parts that control each body part. And these maps are modifiable through experience. The motor control ones reflect the way individual neurons are connected to particular muscles. The sensory ones reflect how different body parts send their information up to the parietal lobe. And again, I showed you this earlier, but here's the frontal lobe that controls movement. And the body is mapped out along here. The parietal lobe, the body's mapped out along there. And the map looks like this. This shows how much of the cerebral cortex is devoted to the face, the hand, the trunk. Very little to the trunk. A lot to the face and the hands. And these maps will get larger with use and smaller with non-use. For the brain, it really is use it or lose it. If you don't use it, that part of the brain is used for something else. But if you use it a lot, uh, for example, if you learn to play the piano and keep practicing over and over and over again, the part of the body that controls your hands will get larger or the part of the brain that controls your hands, will get larger. So factors contributing to recovery. There are two main factors. One, there's a lot of redundancy in the brain. There are several groups of neurons that basically can do the same thing. Second, because of neuroplasticity, new connections can always form. Now, as we've already said, there is a contralateral control in which the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. But there is, though lesser used, some ipsilateral control where the right side of the brain will control the right side of the body. And you can use that rarely used ipsilateral control to compensate for deficits in a stroke. A factor in stroke recovery is also the use of brain regions in the intact hemisphere. Only one hemisphere is typically affected. Now as far as recovering from aphasia, that is language problems, basically uh, the left hemisphere has to reorganize itself to use what remaining cells there are to control language. And you might recall I mentioned that uh, the right hemisphere controls song, singing. There is one type of recovery 
or therapy for aphasia in which uh, the person begins by singing the words and gradually transitions from singing to talking. There's also what's called the penumbra. That's the area of the tissue that surrounds the stroke core. It has reduced but not absent blood flow. And neurons there are damaged, but typically not dead, or at least most of them are dead. And those neurons can regain their function when blood flow is restored to that region. So the image on the left shows the ischemic core. That's the part where the neurons are dead, but then you have this surrounding area, the penumbra, where neurons are damaged but not dead. And with recovery, the neurons in the penumbra can regain their function and help you recover. Any questions on that? What else will help? Exercise. Edward Taub published a study, excuse me, in which he studied patients with strokes that impaired the ability to use one arm and hand. <clears throat> the unaffected arm, the good arm, was put in a sling for 14 days and the patients were forced to use the affected hand. Now, he's since changed from a sling to having the patients wear something like an oven mitt on the normal hand. Again, the goal is to force use of the affected hand because Taub realized that a lot of the problems with stroke result from learned non-use. You can't use the affected hand well, so you stop using it. And it just gets worse. And this procedure is called constraint-induced movement therapy. You had a control group that received cognitive relaxation physical fitness exercises for the same amount of time. The group receiving the constraint-induced movement therapy did remarkably better at functioning. That's shown here. <coughs> yes? It does not have to be. It will be more effective during that first six months. But it can be done any time. Taub reported one patient that was treated for a stroke 50 years after the stroke. It still saw improvement. Now, the longer you wait, um, the more difficult it is but it's never impossible because your brain, as long as you're living, has that neuroplasticity. And there is a modification of the constraint-induced movement therapy that's now being tried in phasia, that's where people have difficulty talking. Now, how's that done? Well, the person is basically forced to talk. They aren't allowed to point. Uh, or write, or move their head. If they want to communicate, they have to talk. And that has achieved, that's just recently been done in the last five years or so. That is using this notion of constraint induced movement therapy to help improve aphasic problems.
in general, exercise builds brain health. My doctor had a sign in his office that said, exercise is the answer to everything. And in that, I think he was probably right. Exercise at any age can improve learning and memory, delay age-related cognitive decline, reduce neurodegeneration, and alleviate depression. And I'll explain uh, the basic mechanism in a few minutes. Mechanisms that interfere with what are called growth factors, and those are important chemicals in the brain, um, are inhibited by exercise. Interestingly, there is a dose-response relationship between exercise or the amount of exercise and the health-related benefits. You get the best outcomes with moderate exercise. This points out that exercise will help block inflammation. Inflammation is bad. You don't want that. Also help block age-related cognitive decline, <coughs> hypertension, insulin resistance, and other things. It will improve growth factors. Those are very important. They will improve your brain health. And exercise by improving growth factors act somewhat like uh, antidepressants. This shows the way your neuron will normally look, it's a happy, healthy neuron. But when you're depressed, your neurons aren't that happy and healthy. They sort of shriveled up, especially the cerebral cortex and a structure inside your temporal lobe called the hippocampus, which is involved in the formation of memories. In fact, what did the hippocampus say in his retirement speech? Thanks for the memories. <laughs> now, when you take antidepressants, or just about any type of antidepressant, they trigger a whole cascade of events that ultimately produce what's called BDNF. That stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And BDNF is like miracle growth for your brain. They make your neurons look nice and big and healthy. See how much better it looks there than here? That's a happy, healthy neuron. And that makes you happy and healthy so exercise, as well as antidepressants, will do that and help you recover from a stroke. That concludes my talk for tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes, ma'am. That's a good question. Um, uh, I honestly don't know. They they have to relieve the um, the buildup of pressure inside the brain by removing the blood that's leaked out of the vessels. Uh, vessels. So as I mentioned, they put a tube in my brain. When my wife came in to see me, then I was on an artificial respirator. There was a tube coming out that went to a bag that was filled with blood. So, but that has to be done or the blood will kill other neurons. 
and I mentioned that um, I was put in a drug-induced coma. I'm glad they did that because uh, there are other things that go on that can increase the severity of a stroke. Um, when neurons are damaged, they will, let's see, there are, I have to back up just a little, there are different neurotransmitters in the brain. I mentioned acetylcholine, one of them. There's another one called glutamate. It's the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. That is, it, it activates other neurons. But glutamate is also neurotoxic. That is, it can kill other neurons if there's too much of it. When I'm trying, to get, I'm trying not to get too complicated here, but I want you to understand the idea. When uh, neurons get overexcited or damaged, that normally release this glutamate, they will release too much of it. And that, in turn, will affect and could kill or damage neurons that they contact, and they, in turn, can be damaged and affect another set of neurons. So there can be this cascade of neuronal death, um, sort of like if you throw a rock into a pond, they have those ripples going outward. In the central core of the stroke, over a period of about a week or so, you can have this rippling effect of too much glutamate released, uh, killing other neurons. Now, I was put in a drug-induced coma to calm my neurons down so they wouldn't release all this neurotransmitter. Now, that has nothing to do with blood pressure per se, but I'm glad they did, they did that. You have a question? Sorry? Yes. It's me. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Um, you may have already answered part of my question, um, referring to my father who had a stroke the occipital lobe, and um, he, he did live another 10 years, and he got better, and, uh, but his eyesight never really returned. And what he saw, instead of what you and I see, were kind of psychedelic colors and odd images that were not related to what was going on out there. Um, what my question is, is can damage to that lobe, can the neurons repair themselves as well as other parts of the brain? Uh, there is a plasticity, but um, it's in your occipital lobe that you see, and your visual field is mapped out there. So if a particular area has a stroke, you will have a blind spot out there. And you will never be able to see in that area again, wherever that is. He had the opposite, that he had all this his reaction was that he'd have one spot he could see out of. And it wasn't always in the same spot. Well, that would, that would be reflecting neurons that weren't killed. Um, it's sort of like if you have an aura with a migraine. You can get a, uh, sometimes it's a fortification pattern. and. Uh, that reflects activation of neurons in your uh, occipital lobe. Um, that's where your conscious vision is. Now, you have other structures in your brain that control vision, but not conscious vision. So oftentimes, people with uh, damage to their occipital lobe 
even if they're totally blind, will still have what's called blind sight. That is, they'll be blind to the world, but for example, if the cane was here, and I had to, I, or I'm blind, I could still reach out and grab it. That is, there's another unconscious part of your brain that can still control your limb movements and direct your arm to that without you being consciously aware of that going on. Uh, yes. Um, sorry? Yes. Between the two different stroke types, ischemic and the hemorrhagic, is the damage caused by lack of oxygen or by the pressure or what, what actually is causing the damage? Well, the damage is caused by a lack of blood flow. And so in one case, there's no blood flow because an artery is clogged. In another case, because an artery ruptures. In either case, neurons don't get blood. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. A question. Um, lazy eye, untreated, can result in loss of vision at, in the focal point. Uh, can that be corrected in the adult? Typically, um, optical problems like that have to be corrected by age five because your occipital lobe uh, forms specific connections that allow you to see the world in a certain way. And if it's not corrected by age five, then the vision will never be normal. So in that sense, might be able to adjust it a little, but it will never be normal. For example, um, there was a study done with uh, cats where they were raised in an environment in which uh, there are only vertical lines and vertical poles. That is a whole world for the first six months of their life was vertical. After that, uh, they could not see anything that was horizontal. So they'd, they'd walk into well, uh, stairs, or they'd fall down stairs. They, they couldn't really see them. And if you looked at the neurons in their occipital lobe, uh, the neurons would only respond to input to their eyes that was vertical, not horizontal. So there are some things that get wired in place permanently at an early age. Yes? Where is, where is the reasoning center? And can that be affected by a stroke? and? Um, how does that work? Well, reasoning, uh, when you say reasoning, that could mean a lot of things. It's the cerebral cortex. Now, what you're probably mainly referring to is the so-called prefrontal cortex. That's the front of the frontal lobe. That's where your personality resides. Uh, that's where you make plans for the future. Um, that's where you make decisions. Uh, yes, very much so. A stroke can affect that. In fact, um, a stroke can make you basically unemployable because you can't uh, show up for work on the right time. Uh, you can't plan for the future, things like that. That would be the prefrontal cortex. Ooh. 
I'll ask my question. What, um, when you're talking about regaining language, my father had a stroke and he was raised in Germany and he came to and was only speaking in German. And what would be happening in the brain when that happens? Well, probably because the oldest memories are the ones that typically survive. So his knowledge of German would be very, very early uh, from his childhood, whereas English or any other language would be a newer memory. So the older ones, um, I guess you could say, are more hardwired in place. Yes. Okay. You talked a little bit about post-stroke and creating new neuronal pathways, maybe yeah. some, um, <clears throat> and training your, your synapses to work a little bit differently. And how about doing that ahead of time? Like, I'll wear my watch on my left wrist 99% of the time, but I try to switch it off when exercising. Crossing, crossing the midline is supposed to help with creating new pathways in your brain. Can we do some pre-stroke exercises and create a few neuronal, new neuronal pathways? Well, because your brain has neuroplasticity, you can always learn new things. And in general, um, that's a good idea anyway to help ward off Alzheimer's disease. You want to exercise your brain. Your brain responds to challenge. So, Anytime you can learn anything new, it's good. I tell my students I'm going to challenge them and they should thank me for it. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh. Here it comes. What's the deal with uh, post-stroke fatigue? I have some friends who had uh, strokes and perhaps the thing that bothers them the most, and they've lost a, a number of important functions, but the fatigue is uh, really bugs the heck out of them, that they, you know, they re require naps, this and that, and uh, you know, just seeing them, it doesn't appear that that uh, is diminishing very rapidly, and uh, of both these fellows, it's uh, really bothersome to them. Well, I can relate to that, because I do have post-stroke fatigue, for example, before my stroke, I was a professional magician and could easily do four hours of strolling magic like at Packer Family Night up at Lambeau Field. Now I get fatigued after doing a 45 minute show. And basically, it's because using the affected part of your body requires much more energy than it did before your stroke very difficult, like very hard for me to lift my left arm. It takes so much more energy than raising my right arm. I, mean, I can do it, but it's fatiguing. And the best way to counteract post-stroke fatigue is to exercise and improve the functioning. That's really all I can say, but it, it does affect all stroke survivors, yes. Yes, um, it's in that first hour that the neurons start to die. And uh, the greater the time spent between having the stroke and getting treatment, uh, the more of them die. So, yeah, there's that acronym uh, FAST in terms of the stroke. F for face, does one side of your face droop? Arm, do you have difficulty raising one arm? S, speech, is your speech slurred? Can you talk? And T for time, you want to get medical treatment as soon as possible. 
because the more rapid the treatment, the more you can save the neurons. Okay, do we have any other questions? Otherwise, our photographer does. What is, what is the treatment that the, the first responder or when you get to a hospital, what is that first treatment that they'll do for you as a stroke victim? And is it different between what kind of stroke it is? Yes, the first thing they have to do is determine what type of stroke it is. Is it ischemic or hemorrhagic? Because the treatment will be vastly different. If it's ischemic, then they will give you a clot-busting drug to try to eliminate clot. If the person were having a hemorrhagic stroke, they gave that, it would make it much worse. If it's hemorrhagic, they have to find out a way to reduce the bleeding and if necessary, drill a hole in your head and drain off the blood. Did you feel your own stroke coming on before you had it? No. I fell on the floor. Now, no one asked, but I'll mention, uh, some people are interested in stem cell therapy. And at least in Appleton, there are a lot of, uh, or not a lot, but a couple of centers opening up promising stem cell treatment for just about everything, including stroke. There's only been one good study on stem cell treatment for stroke. That was done at Stanford University, and it involved drilling a hole in the skull of patients, having a long needle filled with uh, stem cells, that needle inserted into the brain, into the ischemic core of the stroke, and those stem cells injected. And what they discovered was a, a significant improvement in motor function. And they found it was because, although the stem cells injected died, they secreted chemicals that triggered cells in the penumbra to regain their functioning. So if, some, if you read something about people offering to harvest your fat cells or something, and, inject them in your arm, that's a lot of nonsense. The only thing that's going to improve is that person's bank account. Okay, if there are no more questions, we um, thank you so much for your presentation.